really briefly, um, today we are we're hosting together as a partnership for the benefit of the HLH community. And so there's a variety of different organizations that come together to host these talks. Um, they're all listed up here, the um, us, the Histiocytosis Association, the Histiocytosis Association of Canada, the BMT InfoNet, the Immunodeficiency Foundation, it, Liam's Lighthouse, Eric's Journey, Be the Match, the SIJ Foundation, the Auto Inflammatory Alliance, HLH Heroes Foundation. And then industry and institution partners are also listed on the screen. And we are all working together um, to help talk about the Into HLH registry and the benefits of that as well. So at the end of today's talk, there'll be a little information on uh, the registry in addition to the great content we have for you today. So it's without further ado that I introduce you to your speakers. We have Dr. Michael Jordan, hematologist and oncologist at Ch Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Dr. Jordan studies the pathophysiology and treatment of primary immune regulatory disorders, including hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Dr. Jordan's contributions include pioneering work to model and understand the pathophysiology of HLH and investigation of new modalities of therapy for this disease. Joining Dr. Jordan, we also have Dr. Ed Behrens. Dr. Behrens' research focuses on the pathogenesis and treatment of cytokine storm syndromes, including hemophagocytic syndromes, HLH, and macrophage activation syndrome, MAS. I would love to turn today's talk over to Dr. Jordan and Dr. Behrens, and thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to... Um... Uh, everybody, and uh, thank you for this invitation and the um, introduction. So, so yeah, so uh, really we're going to talk about what's new in HLH research over the last few years. So a little bit about the progress. Hopefully you'll, you'll um, get a sense of the importance of the work, uh, though I think there's, you know, for the, for the sake of brevity, I probably didn't emphasize that too much, but also specifically what role can you play uh, as, um, as potentially a, a patient or loved one um, caring for a patient. So just an overview. Um, uh, so research updates. I will speak about uh, research updates on familial and cancer-associated HLH, and I'll kind of split it into updates related to diagnosis and updates related to treatment. Um, and then Dr. Behrens will speak about research updates related to MAS and secondary HLH. Um, and then I will um, speak again about a bit about the um, the, um, the into HLH registry is really a, a way something that everybody can participate in, and we'll have plenty of time I think for discussion and questions. All right, so uh, just uh, this is just a graph you can get when you look in in uh, the National Library of Medicine about articles uh, that mention the, the term hemophagocytic. Uh, and so that's not going to include every single article, but you you notice in the last thirty years. There's over 7,000 paper, papers published that mention this term. Uh, you know, the peak so far is 2022, where there are 750 papers. Uh, so uh, we, we stay busy trying to keep up on these things, um, as you can imagine. A lot of these papers are probably not um, telling something a whole lot new. A lot of them are review articles or case reports. But still, there is, as you can see, there's really increasing interest. And around the time of the pandemic, uh, you can see that there was a bit of a spike in interest too. And I think that relates to the immunologic issues on everybody's minds. But what's new in terms of understanding of HLH or diagnosing HLH? So I think the first thing I would point out is that in the last few years, but this is a pro this is a, a trend extending even further back, is that there's been a dramatic increase in HLH awareness, which is really excellent news. Uh, so if you look, I, there's really too many to even try to highlight them in the literature. There are numerous case reports and reviews, et cetera, that really point this out. Um, and in particular, you can see that physicians that treat adult patients have sort of woken up to this idea that, oh, HLH, while rare, it, it actually can occur. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that was essentially absent uh, you know, from the research sort of awareness or in the, in the literature. I mean, if you go back even 10 years, it's virtually absent. Um, there's also been a really prominent rise in recognition of HLH in patients with cancer, and that's led to, I would say, a significant shift in the field in terms of awareness. And part of what drives this awareness is this understanding that there are increasing numbers of treatments for HLH, uh, sorry, excuse me, there are increasing numbers of treatments for cancer in which we actually, um, physicians actually try to turn on the immune system to better fight the cancer. Well, part of this sort of immune activating therapies um, you know, when you don't regulate them very well, actually lead to something that's very HLH-like. And this is an, a, a growing awareness in recent years. And I think that's also led 
physicians to understand that HLH occurs even without these therapies in patients with cancer. And that's something that, um, like I said, has really been um, an eye-opening sort of thing. Um, perhaps this is also maybe the influence of COVID, other factors, it's hard to say. Um, the other major update, I would say, is in the last several years, so since about 2020, I think um, around that time, there have been a few more genes identified uh, that uh, can lead to HLH. Most of these genes, so ROG, MAD, and INBES, are in uh, the sort of the, the classic pathway of familial HLH, where there have already previously been identified five or six genes, depending on how you count it, uh, that um, can lead to HLH. And so it's fill, essentially filling in more detail. And for the most part, these are, are rare causes of what is a, a, otherwise a rare disorder. So there, you might say there are minor additions to what we already know, uh, but I think this is important progress. Uh, and so the number of patients that have what appears to be familial HLH in which we can't really define a gene is really shrinking quite small. Okay, so what else is new in terms of diagnosis? So there have been new consensus efforts to try to better uh, identify HLH and also MAS across a variety of medical specialties. So there's a paper published earlier this year. It's a, a little bit technical, but uh, suffice it to say that it's really all about trying to recognize this uh, from many different perspectives. Um, and then uh, there's been a paper uh, starting in 2021 with some, some independent corroborations by other groups in uh, 2022. Uh, and actually, there's another one coming out, I think, any, any minute now in 2023. I don't have listed here. So there have been multiple papers describing sort of a new profile uh, that uh, been, has, has been identified in patients with HLH that really helps you to pick these patients out in terms of what their immune cells look like. So their T cells that actually drive the HLH problem to begin with have a very distinctive appearance. Uh, and in this one particular example from Chatterbretti et al., um, you know, it's very easy to distinguish sick patients with HLH from sick patients that have sepsis or bacterial bloodstream infections. And so, uh, so this is, I think, a useful uh, tool uh, that is going to be increasingly important clinically. Uh, what other what else is new in terms of understanding or diagnosing HLH? Well, the graph here is adapted from the paper that I'm uh, describing here. This is Zareff Lorenz et al. that came out last year uh, that I think is really, um, and, and I'm the senior author, so I, I'll have to be upfront that I'm touting my own horn a bit here, but I think that this paper, largely driven by uh, Dr. Zareff Lorenz, uh, really points, I, I'd say, an important advance. And, and that is, is that we've known for decades, probably at least 50 years, uh, since even before I was born, I think, um, that HLH occurs sometimes in patients with cancer for reasons that we do not understand still, uh, but that it really does occur. And um, uh, But uh, identifying these patients is often extremely difficult, and they may be identified after they've passed away, actually. Uh, but um, this paper actually looked at a new way to try to carefully distinguish the patients that appear to be inflamed from those that are not. And as you can see, uh, being able, and this term is called the optimized HLH inflammatory index, uh, the OHI. And you can see the patients that are inflamed do much, much worse than the patients that don't have evidence of inflammation. This is at the time that their cancer is first recognized. So this has nothing to do with treatments for the cancer necessarily. Uh, and so um, really, I think this is a tool to allow us to recognize these patients more quickly, more easily, and hopefully more effectively, because as of yet, the, how to treat these patients is not really clear. Uh, and that's a whole other discussion. But I think this is the beginning of a new chapter in terms of understanding HLH. So what's new for treating HLH? Well, overall, I think in recent years, so, so none of these things I'm going to mention here are completely new to the last two or three years. Uh, but there's been a lot of progress here. Uh, and one is that JAK inhibitors first recognize as a potential useful approach for treating HLH, you know, uh, in, the, in the late uh, 20-teens. Uh, but in the last couple few years, there have been uh, many, many more cases reported for um, uh, using this drug, using these drugs rather in patients. So there's been case reports, case series, there has been a small clinical trial from China uh, reporting uh, use of uh, one particular JAK inhibitor called ruxolitinib uh, in, um, um, in a fairly brief window uh, of time before patients um, um, in, in, um, in patients with mostly EBV HLH. Uh, and um, there's been additional experimental evidence justifying 
various JAK inhibitors, and there's uh, now increasing number of these drugs with different sorts of specificity. Uh, and there's been some data that suggests that there may be some mixed impact of these drugs uh, in the context of HLH, perhaps a reason to, you know, to proceed carefully with clinical trials. And indeed, there are ongoing clinical trials uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, and as well, additional trials in China that are ongoing. Uh, there has been more experience with imipalumab. Uh, so the initial, so imipalumab is uh, an anti-interferon gamma antibody that's FDA approved for the treatment of HLH. Um, there have been some additional reports since the principal report in uh, 2020, uh, but overall it's, it's mostly a matter of gaining more experience. And Dr. Behrens will mention one report in his slides as well. Uh, also a, an interesting finding in, within the last year or two is that bone marrow transplant appears to be quite helpful for adults with HLH. So traditionally, children with HLH, children with familial HLH, were the, were the main ones in which we thought about going to transplant because they have an inborn problem. And so you need to replace the immune system with a new one that doesn't have that problem. And so you have to do that through bone marrow transplantation. Uh, and so there wasn't much thought about, or wasn't as certainly as much thought about taking adults with HLH to bone marrow transplant. But it turns out that um, when patients uh, present as adults, and they may be not young adults, even somewhat older adults, uh, when they present with HLH, it, it appears that there are certainly a subset, and perhaps many of these patients, that probably benefit uh, from getting to um, bone marrow transplantation sooner than later. And so that's really, a, a I think, a potential, real potential change in, in therapy. Um, so, and interestingly, starting back in 2020, and there have been some follow-up uh, reports uh, since then, uh, is this completely new idea that for treatment of HLH that's driven by an infection by a virus called EBV, that instead of suppressing the immune response, what you may actually want to do is to help turn on the immune response to better control the virus. So there are immune activating therapies that are currently approved for the treatment of cancer. Uh, and it turns out that in um, now a number of series, mostly from China, describing this idea that if you give these immune activating therapies to patients with chronic EBV infection leading to HLH, that they may actually control the virus better. Uh, and this is sort of the opposite of what you, you one might traditionally do uh, for these patients. Uh, and then what else is new for treating HLH? So uh, a very recent report uh, by Verkamp et al., and I'm the, the senior author on this uh, paper as well, uh, is, that, is that we look back carefully at all of our patients treated the traditional way with traditional medications for HLH, which are principally etoposide and dexamethasone. And we realized that uh, while we know that for many of these patients, you have to customize therapy, you have to go up or go down, depending on uh, what the patient needs, we realized that um, what perhaps no one's really realized before is that very quickly after starting this sort of standard approach therapy, you can actually tell uh, by a variety of markers listed here in panel B, who is going to do well and get to bone marrow transplant safely, and who is not going to do well uh, and not make it to bone marrow transplant. Uh, and so this combination of markers, which can be assessed relatively quickly after the start of therapy, I think is an important sort of finding that may uh, really alter how patients are treated with HLH, uh, you know, hopefully around the world. So, uh, and so I think that and this is especially important because we have increasing numbers of treatment options uh, between, you know, traditional drugs like etoposide, uh, perhaps um, there are other drugs like alemtuzumab, which is an, an alternative drug that's been around for decades, but also newer agents such as JAK inhibitors or uh, imipalumab, that, that's a, you know, the one that's officially approved for the treatment of HLH. We just have more and more options, uh, and there's going to be more in the future as well. So I think making these decisions uh, as soon as possible is probably going to be in the patient's interest. So um, at this point, I'm going to um, hand over um, and let's see here, I think, um, all right, good. I'm gonna hand this over uh, to Dr. Behrens who will um, take on the, the uh, his part of the talk from here. Thanks, Mike, for um, uh, for um, uh, setting me up for the, for this uh, part of the of the webinar. So I am gonna speak more to um, the, the macrophage activation syndrome, secondary HLH world. And, you know, the names that people use for these things are confusing. Um, and and debated in many different venues, and I sort of hate those debates because I'm not sure it actually even helps us um, 
uh, move further in our, in our understanding, but then just to sort of get some clarity in what we're talking about when we're talking about this. Um, I think these days, most people use the term macrophage activation syndrome to refer to an HLH-like presentation. You know, clinically it looks just like HLH, but instead of being due to a genetic defect, it's usually seen in patients with some other underlying rheumatologic or autoimmune condition. And the most common one is this disease called systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis, where somewhere between 10 and 50% of patients, depending on how you want to count and, 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 and classify, will actually end up developing an episode of MAS um, during their disease course. There's this broader term, secondary HLH, which tends to refer to HLH presentations where we can't find a gene that doesn't feel like it's a genetic cause, often happening in, in older you know, children, teenagers, that kind of thing. And often after some other trigger, like an infection or other illness, um, and so while it looks a lot like HLH, feels like it's something different because it's not related to the same kinds of genes that Mike just talked about. And then you'll see other kind of words out there. So some people talk about this thing called Ruma HLH, which I presume to be another way of saying MAS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS. There's all sorts of many other names that you may read about or hear about on the internet. I think they're, they're all sort of a lot of ways of saying the same thing, which is that there are some people that get this thing but don't have the primary HLH genes, um, you know that 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 Mike was was just talking about. And the reason why that's important is that the other thing that often distinguishes this, this population is that many of these um, um, patients are actually able to recover with medical therapy and don't necessarily go on to bone marrow transplants. Some of them do get bone marrow transplants, but many of them do not. And so the kinds of questions that we're going to ask about in our research questions, you know, um, that is reflected what you'll see in the literature of the last couple of years have to do with trying to understand what those differences are and can we learn from those differences about better alternative ways to treat patients to, to make them better because these are often patients that are going to require more chronic therapies since they're not getting a definitive cure like a bone marrow transplant. So one I think really exciting area that has I think exploded in the last few years is another inflammatory molecule, a cytokine called interleukin-18 or IL-18. And the reason why this has been getting um, attention is that the major function of this cytokine is to induce the cytokine interferon gamma, which is, you, as you heard from, from, from Dr. Jordan's part of the talk, um, is really a central cytokine in HLH. And in fact, we have a drug that, that uh, acts in this way to treat HLH. And the palamab, as was mentioned, the way that it works is it blocks interferon gamma. And so IL-18 is important because it is a way of making excess interferon gamma with a mechanism that's different than all that cytotoxic T-cell defect genes that, that Dr. Jordan was talking about. And in fact, we now have at least three so-called IL-18 apathies, diseases of IL-18, that develop HLH or MAS-like features, but don't do this because of a problem with T-cell cytotoxicity, but do this because these are diseases that are fundamentally genetic problems via IL-18, and this includes XIAP, NLRC4, and CDC42. But also importantly, we know that this same molecule, the same IL-18 cytokine, is highly elevated in systemic JIA patients that develop macrophage activation syndrome. So it also seems to be important in these non-genetic conditions as well. And so, Understanding this from a mechanistic perspective helps us then begin to ask questions, can we actually target this to treat patients? Can this actually be a druggable uh, pathway? And in fact, the answer might be yes. Um, there is a drug that is um, um, not yet FDA approved called Tadakitic Alpha. It is a, um, um, a molecule that actually is a recombinant, uh, a synthesized version of a molecule that our own bodies make that neutralizes the activity of IL-18. Um, and a trial to use this, this drug to treat uh, patients with NLRC4 or XIAP um, um, causes of their MAS actually just completed enrollment and actually just completed the last visit um, in October of this year. We don't have data out yet, but hopefully shortly we'll actually unblind this trial and know where we're at. In the meantime, there is... Um, at least one case report of a patient of XIAP deficiency that has been successfully managed with this drug on a compassionate use basis. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it is exciting 
um, and um, 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 uh, you know something to look forward to that this may be a new therapy on the horizon for this particular subset of patients um, for chronic medical management of of their condition. Um, it, there's a there's a there's actually a number of different drugs that are being developed by different pharmaceutical companies. This is another one called MAS eight two five. This is an antibody that actually has two functions. It can block IL-18, and it also blocks another cytokine called IL-1-beta at the same time. I didn't get into the details. It's relevant because IL-1-beta is a major cytokine that is important for these systemic GIA patients that we were talking about. And there's an ongoing trial, just like the Tadakinic trial, there's an ongoing trial for this drug in, in nrc 4 and XIAP. That trial is not yet completed enrollment, so that is still ongoing. But there are also many patients being treated with compassionate use protocols across the United States for the treatment of systemic JA with MAS or with this other complication of systemic JA that, that's, that's called LD or lung disease. And in fact, we reported a, um, a patient where we successfully treated um, a child with um, systemic JA lung disease as, and who also had refractory recurrent macrophage activation syndrome, who's now doing better on this drug. So I think you know, IL-18 is an exciting um, uh, forefront, both from a basic understanding of why some people actually get HLH and MAS, but then also taking and translating those mechanistic studies to the clinic in the form of various therapies uh, to, interrupt, uh, um, to interrupt this pathway and hopefully um, have uh, safer and more efficacious treatments. Um, Another question, and, and 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 much like Dr. Jordan did, I'm going to admit, I'm going to start, I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit here. But this is this has been a, something that has like I've been obsessed with for probably 15 years, which is like, you know, it's in the name of the disease. Um, it's weird because not even all the patients with the disease even have hemophagic cytosis. But like, what a crazy thing to do. I mean, like, why does this even happen in the first place, right? Like, what what a wild thing for somebody's body to actually do this? Like why even have the capacity to instruct your cells to eat your own other cell, red blood cells? Um, and you know, one of the things that has struck me for a while is, is that there's actually a lot of interesting features of HLH and MAS that involve iron and heme dysregulation, right? It's not just the fact that macrophages are eating red blood cells, but there are other markers that we actually use to diagnose these patients that also relate to iron and heme. Heme is the molecule that actually holds the iron in our red blood cells. Um, and you may recognize some of these things. You may recognize the ferritin because we measure that in a lot of these patients. There are these other molecules called haptoglobin receptor and another molecule called heme oxygenase 1. Both of those also have to deal with, um, with iron and heme, and those are elevated um, um, very dramatically in HLH and MAS patients. Uh, HLH and MS patients get an anemia. So again, there's something wrong with the red blood cells. Um, and, and, and one of the things that has intrigued me is that um, there have been now a number of different groups that have suggested that actually one of the functions that hemophagocytes have is they actually produce anti-inflammatory molecules or they actually show evidence of uh, anti-inflammatory programs that suggests that maybe there's something about this abnormal iron heme red blood cell regulation that feels somehow central to HLH that has to do with trying to control inflammation. And so we've been thinking about this um, um, uh, for a while. Uh, and uh, th this is a, a, a paper out of, out of my group where we, we've looked at some of these molecules and animal models. And to make the long story short, we've got this long comp as scientists are wont to do, lots of arrows. They all point in a thousand different directions. That usually means we have no idea what's going on. Um, but we have some idea of what's going on here. And I think that, you know, I I'm pretty convinced at this point in time, both from some of the work that we've done as well as the work of others, that this iron metabolism pathway that involves these molecules, hemoxygenase 1, and the molecule that actually controls hemoxygenase 1 called NERF2 or NRF2 really are controlling some of these anti-inflammatory pathways that touch the very molecules that are central to HLH. And this includes cytokines like interferon gamma and, um, and IL-12, which collaborates with IL-18 to make interferon gamma. Um, and again, I think the reason why this fundamental mechanistic work is important is that 
once again, these are druggable targets. There is an FDA approved drug that actually activates the NERF2 pathway. It's used in multiple sclerosis patients. It's called dimethylfumarate. You know, and, and if these ideas are correct, this may be yet another potential therapy for these MAS patients that aren't necessarily going to get a bone marrow transplant, but need alternative chronic therapies that um, can help them control the inflammation with the least amount of toxicity um, that speaks specifically to the kind of pathways that are regulated or dysregulated um, in HLH and MAS. And so I think hopefully we'll be hearing more about these pathways in, in, in upcoming research as well. Um, another um, another um, molecule of interest that, again, some of you may have heard about clinically is this molecule CXCL9. So this is an incredibly useful um, biomarker for HLH and MAS patients because what CXCL9 measures is really the amount of interferon gamma activity in the body. So what happens is, is that interferon gamma turns on the expression, the release of CXCL9, right? And so interferon gamma, depending on the way in which you measure it, can sometimes be hard to measure. But CXCL9, particularly the, the, the assay that's used by um, Cincinnati Children's that I think most of us are sending our, our, our testing to, is really a great biomarker for interferon gamma activity in these patients with HLH. And so it's useful because if you're going to go and give, for instance, emipalumab or a JAK inhibitor, these drugs that block interferon gamma activity, then you can actually try and measure the CXCL9 and see if it goes down as you give the drug. A really sort of useful molecule for us in, in diagnosing and managing these patients in the clinic. But God didn't invent CXCL9 so that Cincinnati Children's could measure it and tell us what the interferon gamma activity is in our, in our patients, right? Like it's a molecule that serves some other function. And in fact, the real, the biologic function of this molecule is that it acts as an attractant to tell immune cells to come into the tissues. And so, um, you know, we and, and, and lots of people have sort of thought to themselves, well, geez, maybe that is, this is actually one of the things that interferon gamma does that causes organ failure in HLH and MAS, right? Like one of the things that may be happening is that interferon gamma turns on CXCL9 and CXCL9 says to the immune cells, hey, come here, beat up on this tissue, right? And so maybe it's not just a biomarker, but it actually is part of the causative process of the disease itself. Uh, and so uh, because we've been tossing this idea around for a while, Actually, our group tried to look at this in a, in, a, in a couple of different animal models. We looked at this in the perforin deficient HLH model that Dr. Jordan um, developed. We looked at it in an MAS model that my lab developed. We looked at it by using both genetic uh, models where we genetically get rid of CXL9. We looked at it using a drug that blocks the activity of CXL9. So we did this actually in four different ways. And no matter how we cut the pie, we got the same answer back which is that interestingly enough, CXL9 does nothing in terms of disease activity parameters. You can completely eliminate this molecule and the mice get just as sick um, as, as, um, as mice that have completely intact CXL9. And so interestingly, while this is a really super useful biomarker of interferon gamma activity, it's probably unfortunately not a druggable target. It's probably not, even though there are drugs that exist to block this molecule, they're unlikely to be useful um, for HLH or MAS, at, at least if you believe the animal model data, um, because it doesn't seem to play a role in the disease. And again, these are the same models where interferon gamma plays a clear direct role um, and predicted, in fact, sort of presaged the idea that emipalumab would work in those same models, CXL9 doesn't seem to matter. So I think it's sort of an interesting little story there that, that probably the door is closed on that, still useful as a biomarker, unlikely to be useful as a therapeutic target. And then Dr. Jordan alluded to this. Um, I think this important study came out. You know, we know there was the big paper that that sort of looked at this for primary HLH. Um, um, a trial, a similar trial, was done for MAS patients. These were basically patients with um, um, MAS um, from uh, systemic JA. Um, trial was done in the same way: single arm. Everybody gets the drug, and we just sort of see what happens but these were patients that were already sort of refractory to initial therapies with, with steroids. Um, and 13 out of 14 patients were able to get on a remission with the, um, with the use of emipalumab. Um, and so, you know, I think good news, 
um, um, uh, the, the drug not only is useful for the primary HLH patients, but it really looks like it's going to be useful um, uh, for the secondary patients as well. So we're increasingly getting more options for our patients, uh, which is exciting. And then finally, um, you know, um, uh, this is sort of just another kind of interesting paper. This actually, this paper, I think, I think is the one that Dr. Jordan was referring to that just got published with that marker that you can separate out the the um, the HLA or the MAS patients from from sepsis patients because they use those exact same markers. Unless there's another paper that he knows about that I don't know about, but this paper basically uses the those exact same markers that CD38 HLA-DR markers and could say that, yep, we can find MAS patients and they're different from sepsis patients because they've got these unique so-called cycling lymphocytes that have these special markers. Um, and they took it a step further and actually showed that the thing that is actually making these cells come out is yet another cytokine called type one interferons. So if there's an interferon gamma, you're probably not surprised to learn there's also an interferon alpha and interferon beta. Alpha and beta are type 1, gamma is type 2. We talk a lot about gamma and type 2 in the HLH-MAS world because that is the central cytokine. But what this paper suggests is that, in fact, it is the type 1 interferons that turn on these special cells that show up in, in MAS patients. And it's those cells that then, in turn, make the interferon gamma. And so there's this whole sort of circuit that goes from type 1 interferons into type 2 interferons. And that's also relevant, understanding that basic, basic mechanism is relevant because there are indeed medicines that target type 1 interferons, such as the JAK inhibitors, but also specific antibodies that are already FDA approved for other diseases in rheumatology land that are type 1 interferon mediated that maybe could be repurposed for the MAS world and secondary HLH world. So an interesting idea that's not yet been tested, but I think this paper suggests a direction that we might move in to sort of look at that, right? And so again... I think the common theme here is people are asking really good questions about some of these basic mechanisms, um, but not just, you know, to sort of for the sake of understanding, but because each of these things are potentially druggable targets. We can take that knowledge and either repurpose an already existing drug or develop a, an entirely new drug um, um, that can actually target these functions um, and I think be useful therapies particularly for these patients that are likely going to require longer term medical therapy because they're not going to bone marrow transplant. Um, so I think the future looks really quite bright for the secondary HLH MAS patients because I think there's just been an explosion of this kind of work that, uh, that has been quite fruitful. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Jordan to talk about the INTO HLH registry. So I just wanted to um, uh, talk for a few moments about this registry effort that we've started. Uh, over the last year, and it's called the INTO HLH Registry, and that stands for Insights in the Natural History and Treatment Outcomes of Hemophagocytic Lymphohistiocytosis. So this is a registry which we have opened, uh, and uh, you know this uh, with the intention of trying to get have a deeper understanding about HLH. But I really want to stress that it's open to everybody with every possible form of HLH, whether that be familial genetic HLH, whether it be MAS, which is sort of the rheumatologic HLH, whether it be cancer-associated HLH. It includes individuals that have been successfully treated for HLH and those that have not survived a treatment with HLH. So it's really open to everybody because we want to try to uh, understand as deeply as possible. So there are, there are really, you know, why the question I think that's fair to ask is why do we need this registry? And the answer it's pretty simple, is that there are many, many details about HLH and its outcomes after treatment that really remain just um, incompletely understood, some of which are very, very poorly understood. So we don't, um, you know, there's lots of expert opinion. Uh, myself, Dr. Behrens, others have experience that stretches back decades in, in some cases. Uh, but even with that sort of experience, uh, we, we don't really know enough because <clears throat> you know, I may see a patient that's very unusual that may be different than what Dr. Barron sees and vice versa. So we really need to understand much more in much more detail how this uh, process develops clinically in patients and in a variety of different patients. How do we best measure response to therapy? These sorts of things have really never been sort of, you know, carefully reported. I shouldn't say never, excuse me, have been, uh, in very only limited context been reported. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we have increasing options for treatment. So how do we choose amongst these options? I think we need to um, understand better the, the, the sort of the typical course after treatment in order to answer that question. 
Um, you know, how does HLH affect patients' quality of life? There have been some efforts, uh, but again, there's much more information needed and much more information is needed about the, both the short and the long-term complications that patients experience. So there's a lot we still need to learn. Uh, and we are unlikely to be able to learn that with case reports, individual experience of physicians, uh, those sorts of things as what, um, you know, really fill up the literature currently. So now uh, it's important to understand that this is something where it only works if we all work together. Uh, and that includes yourself, uh, patients or, uh, you know, loved ones of patients, either, either um, parents of children or uh, next of kin of those that have passed away. Uh, you can all participate and actually help make a difference in the future. And the, re and the way this works is that for this registry, we really, our hope is to try to gather data, detailed data about patients with HLH uh, in all contexts. In order to do that, we need the consent of the in affected individual if they're an adult or their parent if they're a child. Uh, and we also specifically need uh, per um, um, uh, permission to gather the medical records specifically. Uh, and so with those things in mind, uh, we could actually begin to sort of answer these more with, uh, detailed um, sort of questions when we gather data from many patients. So what does participation mean? So as, as I already kind of mentioned, first it would mean to, to consent to participate. Uh, and in fact, we have this, we've tried to make this process as easy as possible. Uh, and um, I'll talk about that more in just a second here. But so, um, and so with your consent, we would gather the records covering the time period of HLH and up to five years after that, if it's been that long. Uh, and we would gather information about the HLH itself, the complications, the treatments, the outcomes. We also would like to get ask your opinion, frankly, um, about uh, how HLH has affected your life or your child's life. So there will be some additional surveys we would ask people to, to fill out to help us understand that in your own words. And as you would imagine, um, you know, this is an, an effort where we're gathering information. So really the key thing is, is what are we doing to protect that information? So, and there really are multiple things. Um, so part of the process is that we centralize this information in a, in a single secure database um, here at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, with the processes we follow are the same processes that your physician's office follows when handling your medical record uh, for your routine care. Uh, and we also follow um, uh, guidelines that are the FDA sort of um, mandates for um, um, for, excuse me, one second here, uh, for the conduct of clinical research as well. We anonymize the data in our database, so it's connected only to the patient's record through um, a number that helps us to anonymize this, the actual information that we've pulled out. Uh, and um, uh, and we only allow access to this information to the to the trained and certified individuals of our team. Uh, and of course, we should core this, uh, excuse me, <coughs> store this in a secure database. So, um, so how do you enroll in the registry? So if you go to this website, hlhregistry.org, you could just Google HLH registry and this should pop up as, as one of, if not the top sort of uh, thing in a Google search. Uh, if you go to that webpage, there's a button that says join the fight. If you click on that button, it will uh, take you through this process. And the process in brief is that you will receive an email with a secure link to our electronic consent system. So you can go online to do all the consenting in your own time as you please. Uh, and um, if that is technically challenging or not really desirable, uh, then you can obviously you can reach out to us with a, a con, you know, through the contact us. Uh, and um, I'll show you our email and phone number here in just a second. Uh, and, you know, somebody from the team here can actually reach back to you either by email or phone call uh, if you like to sort of walk through the consent process. Um, it does take a little bit of time, probably 20, 30 minutes or so to sort of complete this because we will be asking you uh, not only for you to read the detailed uh, information to consent to, but also um, a little bit more information that allows us to gather the medical records, such as you know, where were you or your child treated? Uh, we do need the last four digits of Social Security only because hospitals require us to provide that when, prov when requesting records. Uh, and, um, and so, but it's, but it's generally basic information. So if it's been a while, you may have to stop and, and think about, you know, where all patients were treated. Uh, but at this point, I was going to um, stop the, uh, the slides here. Uh, and just wanted to point out, this is 
um, um, the website down here. It's hlhregistry.org. We have an email address here that you can either see on the slide, or if you go to the webpage, you'll see the email address there. Also, there's a phone number here you can easily reach out to us uh, at as well if you'd like to try to reach somebody at the registry and and um, and talk about uh, joining the registry or actually you know proceed with um, with consenting to join the registry. So, so I'm gonna stop the slides here, and um, I'm gonna hand the control back over to Deanna. So, um, all right. Okay, good. So we have time. So if you have any questions, I would say, please put your questions in the Q and A um, queue. Uh, and while um, while we're considering that, um, I have a question uh, for you, Ed, if you if you don't mind answering. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, one a question I was wondering is that you know the the finding in terms of hemophagocytosis that uh, that hemophagocytosis is actually you know probably helpful. It's probably anti-inflammatory in a way, and it probably is a good thing, even though we think it could be harmful in other ways. Um, uh, but it, uh, but ultimately, by digesting these red cells, you induce this protein NRF2, uh, which you can also induce with a drug. Do you know if the drug, the dimethyl fumarate, has a direct impact on the macrophage behavior uh, in terms of suppressing hemophagocytosis or otherwise altering that hemophagocytic process that we see in the disease? Yeah, so that's that's actually an active question that we're working on. Um, uh, you know, and 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 to be fair, uh, I'm not, you know, whether hemophagocytosis is good or bad or not, or both, right, is a complicated question. It's, it, it, may, it may be an ineffectual way of trying to accomplish this anti-inflammatory task. And so the idea is, um, can one help that along pharmacologically with a drug rather than maybe the, the the less desirable eating of all the cells that the macrophages are doing. So yeah, so we're definitely like working on trying to understand whether you can alter hemophagocyte activity by altering NERF2 activity or whether, you know, um, it, all other cell types, because this molecule is, is uh, present in lots of different cell types. Um, if you turn on in other cell types, you get sort of more bang for your buck. So I think definitely more to come. I don't have an answer for you just yet. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. So there are some uh, questions in the queue. Uh, so one is asking about um, after stopping cyclosporin, or this is an immunosuppressive drug, uh, could somebody get vaccinated? Uh, and um, that is a uh, maybe a complicated question. So there are, um, I, I have a simple answer, but I also have some caveats is that, you know, generally speaking, you're not going to vaccinate somebody who's on active immune suppression. There are exceptions to that, uh, but if you expect, you know, you know this immune suppression is going to end, it's probably is wiser to wait. Uh, but uh, you know, um, and immune suppression could could vary depending on the individual. So if they've had to go through multiple different courses, it might be more profound. Um, I think the question here, though, is that the immune suppression was probably was stopped back in July, uh, and they aren't moving on to BMT. You, you know, would you would you go ahead and vaccinate? Um, I, I think there's not necessarily a black and white answer, but I think the short answer is, yeah, I probably would, uh, especially if this was an uncomplicated course, relatively uncomplicated course that they had, then they probably recovered back to the point where it's it's uh, not worth delaying any longer, any longer. <clears throat> so, all right. So um, uh, another question is, is there a clear definition of refractory secondary HLH? I think I will toss that one to Dr. Behrens. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe what's unclear is that secondary HLH is unclear, right? Like that, in, in, that encompasses so many different things, but I would, I would argue that, you know, refractory secondary HLH, um, would be HLH that did not easily come into remission with sort of the typical first line drugs, right? So if you're talking about secondary HLH with respect to systemic J, that would be steroids, IL-1 blockade, and cyclosporin is the cocktail that I think most rheumatologists use. Um, if we're talking about non-systemic J, secondary HLH, then it's probably steroids and like whatever drug that 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 the team, you know, decided to use as like their sort of first line therapy. If the condition did not sort of remit with that or it got better and then it's come back again for a second time, um, I think that probably puts you in the category of refractory. It just simply means didn't come go into remission easily with first line therapies and go away and stay away. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
Well, so I have to say, um, rheumatologists can be slippery, if I can comment. <laughs> you know, they, um, I was just talking to a rheumatologist earlier today about uh, treating MAS with pulse steroids. I'm like, yeah, do you mean, you mean three days or six days or nine days, you know, total of pulse steroids? <laughs> and they were like, well, yeah. So yes, is, I actually, well, the, yes, everyone's got radiation. their own regimen. Everyone's got their own regimen. What, 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 what appropriate first line therapy um, would be would maybe different from uh, from 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 group to group too, right? And so, you know, that's why it's I think not so easy to answer the question. But I think in general, refractory would mean your team is given what they thought was their best first line therapy, and the patient's not gotten better. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fair. <laughs> and All I would right. I, I would say three days, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. But oh well. So, um, all right. Well, and so there's another question in the chat about uh, registering for uh, so joint, signing up for the registry. Uh, and, you know, the short answer to that question is kind of sort of when uh, I, the short answer is there is no time like the present. Uh, the sooner the people sign up, uh, the better. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, is that we we're trying to meet our goals to enroll as many patients as possible before the end of the year. Uh, but the other reason is that if somebody, let's say, was diagnosed recently with HLH, uh, in some ways, the sooner they join the registry, we think probably the higher the quality of the data is. It allows us to be able to reach out to the treating physician to ask them survey questions as well about, you know, what are they thinking, which is really difficult things to ever capture after the fact. And also in terms of asking uh, how HLH has affected the individual and the family, that sort of information is much better. Um, I, I think that, you know, while the patients are experiencing as opposed to after the fact. So I would encourage everybody that could join the registry to sign up as soon as practical. We try to make, like I said, we try to make it as easy as possible. If it's not, if it's not working well for you, then, then there are some sort of human touch ways. You can reach out to the individuals, uh, you know, on the team to sort of kind of walk you through things. Um, uh, but, but I would say I really appreciate the interest in potentially, um, you know, joining the registry because it really is uh, only going to work if we all work together. And so, the more people that are aware of the registry, if so, you yourself or your loved one can't sign up. If you know those that could, I would encourage you to please try to share, uh, you know, please try to share the information so that more people can can know about this opportunity. All right, I think with that, we'll hand it back over to Deanna. Thank you. Uh, there were uh, two questions that came in related to treatment, so um, I'll try to put them together. However, if you'd like, we can separate them. The first is about resources and treatments recommended for adult patients, and then the other is regarding the 2004 HLH protocol, and if that's the most recent. I know the Histiocyte Society recently published consensus um, for treatment on their website for HLH, uh, but I was just wondering if you would maybe comment on both of those resources for adult treatment and then the 2004 for HLH protocol, and if that is the most recent, or if there are other um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think it's um, I think it's pretty fair to say that the, this um, the the society trial, either HLH ninety four or two thousand and four, is really the standard of care. Uh, now it gets the questions. There's a few fine details there. So um, there are there are not a lot of changes made between these two studies. Um, the, uh, there are a few minor modifications, some of which were helpful. One of which was generally not very helpful was the use of cyclosporin at the beginning of therapy. Uh, and, um, and so, so if somebody asked me, you know, what's the standard of care? I say it's HLH 94 because it doesn't use that early cyclosporin. Um, but other than, but, you know, there are a couple other very minor changes that I think are useful. So it's, People may mean different things when they say 94 or 2004, but treatment with these the two main drugs, etoposide and dexamethasone, is, is still appropriate standard of care. Now, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and in and some countries around the world, but not all countries, uh, there is another drug that's approved called imipalumab for the treatment of HLH. In general, uh, we and most people wait to see kind of how patients do with the standard therapy and either move on or add on the additional drug if needed. Um, but it really kind of depends on how the patient's doing. So where we start with is the, what I call HLH 94, but some people may sort of ambiguously refer to as HLH 2004. So that's that first question. Sorry. And the other question, um, Deanna was- um, Sorry, Mike, we, we should just say that because yeah. people also sometimes use the, the brand name Gamafant um, for emipalumab. So- Yes. Because um, I'm, I'm just looking at the chat. So Gamafant is emipalumab. 
Oh yeah, thank you. So I only use the proper name, but I recognize that the brand name is a great name. So, and people like to use it, yeah. So, all right. Um, okay, sorry, Deanna, I, I, I kind of caught that first question about what's the standard protocol, but what was, is the question, is there something new, right? Um, or was it different? Yeah. And new and um, and I think that you you responded to that at the uh, uh, just other resources on treatments for adult patients if it differs from the the standard of care you just described or if there are alternatives for adult patients. Right. Okay. Yeah. So specifically for adults, that is a um, a somewhat difficult question because the standard therapy for children with HLH is generally pretty well tolerated by young children, not so easy tolerated by adults. Uh, and so there are some suggestions about how to adjust things. And there have been um, publications, uh, formal ones on behalf of the History Site Society that make suggestions, but there really isn't great data to base that on. So it is more about expert opinion. Uh, and um, uh, and so the, the, um, the context definitely matters in terms of whether or not it's associated with, uh, let's say something like Stills disease or cancer or whether it's unknown. Uh, and so it's, uh, and, you know, are there good resources? Um, there, unfortunately, there really aren't. Um, I think HLH experts at various places do see adults, but most of us are pediatricians. Thank you. I have one uh, somewhat of a follow-up question to that, and then there is another question in the Q&A. Um, the follow-up is around, you know, helping to advocate as a family for an HLH patient or educate um, healthcare provider who may not be as familiar, and then you know also with that, how to just just share the progress and research around HLH. Are there resources that families can lean on, or how to how to advocate? And then this was coming from the family that asked the question about the adult treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are there? Um, you know, that's that's an excellent question in the sense that there are papers that I recommend to um, physicians that may reach out to me personally, maybe I'm sure Dr. Behrens has some of the same sort of thing, but is there an organized resource accessible to families, for instance, that they could utilize for helping to educate you know, caregivers? Um, there really isn't, and there's a need for that. Ed, Ed do you have any, uh, any thoughts? I don't know if you guys have anything organized through your, you know, look, to chop locally? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, and I think you guys do too, right? I mean, I think we all have like yeah. our, our little like blurbs on our on our on our websites, which are which are I think good starting points. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you're right. I mean, you know, there's I can't think of like the um, there's not like a an easy resource that that yeah that's like sort of dedicated to that sort of lay you know here's for 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 what others need to know about this disease. So mm -hmm. that may be something we should take up. Yeah, right. Yeah, like th there are some information there, like an algorithm, for instance. Right. right. Uh, but there isn't a, um, let's say, like an organized thing that's maybe more comprehensive or more, you know, lay friendly, even, right? Right. So, yeah. 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 There's information on the Histiocytes uh, Society website in the Histiocytosis Association as well that might be beneficial um, in terms of advocating. I think also leaning into various resources, but yeah, I think there might some organized effort toward that might be really helpful. So maybe we can we can talk more about that. Um, it seemed like the other question that was in the Q and A was was answered, but it was um, in response to uh, who can en enroll and attend in the in the registry, um, and it's North America. American at, um, patients and families at this time. Are there plans in the future to expand that? Um, so um, we're thinking about, so the way that we work is that we would um, obtain the medical records uh, and, 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 and extract the information, put it in our database to organize it. So obviously the records have to be in English since we don't have staff for non-English speaking records. Uh, but then the other issue is that we have to be able to obtain the records. And so we haven't yet thought about how we could do this sort of approach in say, for instance, like England or Australia or other English speaking countries in large part because our ethical approvals, um, we, don't, um, we don't think that they would necessarily work well in those countries. So that's, that's an issue that we've thought about. And I think we need to think about more, but we don't have a plan in place at this time. Mm 